Today we are in fabulous Las Vegas where I get the invite to play on a WPT cash game live stream. I buy in for $10,000 and face some tough spots against some tough competition. This video will take you inside the mind of a professional poker player in a standard, no ante, two blind cash game, which means the strategy in this game will translate well to your local game even if it's small stakes. So let's buckle up, dive into the session and analyze these spots. Occasionally here and there, I will blur out some of the cards to make it more interactive, just until a critical decision point of the hand so you can play the majority of the hand along with me. I think it'll be more educational when we think through these decisions without having the bias of our opponent's holdings. All right, in this first hand, I am in the big blind with king nine off suit when Cedric raises on the button to three big blinds. These spots 200 big blinds deep are definitely not so straightforward. There's so many things that we can do here but I want you to take a look at what range converter says is optimal for our big blind response here. It's pretty crazy how wide open our range is here. All of this green is what we'll be calling with. And as you can see, king nine offsuit fits squarely in this green. So after the flop comes down, I check it over to Cedric and he checks this one back. The turn comes a queen of diamonds, which now gives us a straight draw. I check this one over again, and this time Cedric decides to put out a small bet of $175. This is actually very close. We are getting decent odds to hit a king or hit a straight card like a jack. The reason why I end up making a call here is because I actually think that sometimes king high is going to be good here. I think after we check twice, there is some possibility that Cedric's going to be bluffing here on the turn. So I go ahead and toss in the $175 and we are off to the river, which improves us. It's the king of clubs. Now we have top pair. I decide to check this one again because I think that in general, this king is going to be better for Cedric's range. So it's a card that he may try to represent more often than not if he was in fact bluffing on the turn. So I go ahead and make the check and Cedric puts out a sizable bet. Obviously, we cannot be folding top pair here. So I quickly toss in the call. Cedric announces ace high, so I just oblige and show my cards. I don't want to make him show his cards here. Even though Cedric is first to show, he's basically conceded the pot by announcing his hand, so I have no problem showing here. Here we have Conrad opening it up from middle position. Folds over to me in the small blind. I look down at a suited ace nine. Definitely feels too good to fold. And according to the range converter, it is pretty borderline here. It likes primarily calling with ace-10, but folding ace-9 suited. Ashley Sleeth defends the big blind. I flop top pair. I'm definitely going to check here, though. We're playing in flow, and whenever it's an ace-high board, Conrad is going to have more aces in this spot. When Conrad checks this one back, it's obvious that our ace pair of aces here is going to be good, so... When the five of spades comes on the turn, I'm going to lead out here. I'd be leading out with some club draws, with some spade draws, with some straight draws. And since I will be betting so many hands here on the turn, I don't need to go too big. So I size for a slightly under half pot. Turns out both of our opponents had a pair of fives and they both get away from it and we take this one down. Cedric raises this one up from middle position. I look down at 7-6 suited in the hijack and I three bet this one up to $450. So Cedric makes it three big blinds. I make it nine big blinds. These are very standard sizings. Three betting with the 7-6 suited isn't exactly standard, but I like to do this every once in a while when deep. Sets me up to possibly win a big pot in position. I have more board coverage when middling boards and small boards come out. Just in general, makes myself tougher to play against. Cedric makes the call and we're heads up to a flop. When the flop comes down, jack five, three rainbow. I do have three to a straight flush. So when he checks it over to me, I'm going to be betting here. There's definitely some turn cards I can barrel on. I can barrel on some diamonds. I can barrel on cards that are bigger than a jack if he ends up calling the flop. I can also just turn a four and make the nuts. So after I put out a small C bet and Cedric makes the call, we find the six of hearts on the turn. At this point, Cedric checks it over again. And since he called a flop bet, there's definitely a possibility that he could have a jack. Could have been calling with some ace high type holdings as well. But this six is just a bit thin to bet on the turn. So I decide to check this one back. By the way, when I say thin, it basically means that it's hard to get called by worse hands. As you can see, there's no flush draws out there. So what we're really targeting is a five. So after I check this one back and the four of heart comes on the river, we do in fact bink a straight. 
Only hand we lose to is 7-8 right now, but because he called a flop bet, he cannot have that hand. So we effectively have the nuts here. He checks it over yet again. There's 1775 in the pot. I end up betting 1100 here, which I think in a single raise pot, this is a good sizing because we're trying to get thin value. When there's a four card straight on the board, it's just really hard to get value. So you tend to have to size down a little bit when you do have your value in single raise pots. But here in a three bet pot, I just don't have a lot of sevens in my perceived range. So I think that I can go a bit bigger here and just hope that he has a jack. I think he's going to call off with a jack. If I size up to all the way close to pot. Anyways, like I said, he makes the snap call. He did in fact have a jack. So we're really cooking here. Already up to about a $4,000 profit early on in the session. Andrew Nimi, the godfather of poker vlogging, raises it up from the hijack and I defend the big blind with king nine off suit. We flop a king and check it over to Andrew who has the betting lead. He puts out a small c bet obviously we're not going to be going anywhere here i think the best option is to call this turn card puts more draws on the board if he had a hand like jack x of clubs queen 10 of clubs if he has diamonds something like ace 10 of diamonds i expect him to continue barreling on this turn card and i expect him to size up which is actually what he did he actually bets more than the pot. There was 625 in the pot and he sizes for 800. Definitely can have a better king. He can have a set of jacks. He can have a set of sevens. So there are hands that beat me, but because of how draw heavy this board is, I think it's a mandatory call here. River is a 10 of clubs and this one quickly goes check, check. This is a well-played hand by Andrew. He perhaps could have bet one more time on the river, but it definitely would have been a bit thin when that card brings in the flush. Brings in some straights as well. Brings in some two pairs. He basically would just be targeting king nine or perhaps a king eight suited type holding that I might defend with. All right, folds to us on the button. We have eight five suited. Gonna open this one up for three big blinds. Jimmy defends the big blind and we're off to a flop that gives us two pair. Board is very draw heavy, two diamonds out there. We do have the backdoor flush draw. So I size up a little bit just because of how many draws are available. Jimmy makes the call and the turn is the king of diamonds. After a little bit of thought, Jimmy now decides to lead this turn card and not an overly big sizing. There's a real possibility that he has a flush now, but I also think that he could be turning a hand like Jack-10 into a bluff. But honestly, the king is probably better for me. So whenever someone is leading a card that is either neutral or better for you, I tend to believe that they're just value betting. Can't exactly fold two pair for this price on this turn though. We can always improve to a boat and he can always just slow down on the river. So I go ahead and toss in the call here. River is a seven of hearts and now there's over $1,500 in the pot. Jimmy throws out 1075. At this point, any six makes a straight. Obviously the diamonds are still there. So far, definitely playing my A game, folding when I'm beat, getting there, which is nice. So far, things are definitely going my way. We did get unlucky there, but we folded and saved quite a bit of money. All right, we're playing a straddled pot here, so I go ahead and open this one up from early position with ace, jack, off suit. Frankie calls in the big blind. I believe that he's gonna have a strong range here because he's taking a shot here, so I don't see him speculating very wide in this spot. And Cedric defends, and I think that he could definitely have anything. He's a, he's a straddle defender for sure. The other thing is, is that Frankie called 300 on a $4,100 stack. So definitely know he's not messing around, which is why when I flop a hand that I should definitely be C betting here, we have a gutter for Broadway. We have an over card. This is just a board that's going to be in general good for my opening range. But like I said, I decide to deviate in this spot because of how tight I perceive that Frankie is playing. Turn comes in eight and no surprise to me, it looks like Frankie is lining up a bet here. He bets a reasonable size. He bets $450, which now puts the pot at $1,375. I'm getting a great price here with a double gutter and I actually believe that he has a good hand. So I believe that my implied odds are very strong here. I do think if I make a straight that I'm going to be able to get all of it. And I may even be able to bluff on a diamond. The river comes a complete brick. It's a three of spades. And Frankie still seems interested in this hand. When he starts lining up chips here, doesn't matter what he bets. I'm not going to be calling with ace high. And as you can see, I quickly 
get away from it. Turns out he had a set of eights. So while I was right that he had a strong range preflop, he actually had nothing on the flop and would have folded. But once he saw that turn card, his hand became very strong. Jimmy raises this one up, plus one, eight-handed, and I defend the big blind with pocket sevens. Not a great flop for sevens here, especially with Jimmy opening it up from early position. I decided to peel one time because he definitely can be c-betting with hands like king queen taking advantage of his range advantage he could have a hand like queen jack hand like jack 10 and even though my hand isn't doing great equity wise against those over cards a lot of times people will shut down on the turn definitely less likely that he has a pair of aces definitely could have been c-betting with a, another pair like pocket tens or better and if he did have a hand like pocket tens or better he probably would bet again here on the turn so when he checks back and the river is the four of diamonds i think he's just gonna have a hand like king high all day here and here's the thing in cash games when you feel like you have the best hand a lot of times what you should do is bet on the river here when the hand plays out this way. It's definitely a bit thin, which is why I need to size down so much. I end up going with around a quarter pot. So definitely a bit ambitious here. But like I said, I was fairly certain I had the best hand. So I put out this little blocker bet hoping to get value. Lynn makes it 250 in the hijack. Looks like we're playing a straddle pot here. I'm in the cutoff with 7-8 suited. I decided to make the call. Andrew in the straddle defends. Lynn decides to check this one over to me and we have second pair here. We have a backdoor flush draw. We have backdoor straight draw. We want to deny equity from over cards. Lynn's going to have some ace kings. She's going to have some ace queens. She's going to have some king queens. So we want to deny equity from those hands. Andrew makes the fold. Lynn makes the call. We're heads up to the turn card, which is the nine of hearts. Pretty interesting. We now have a straight flush draw. Obviously a five makes us a straight. A 10 makes us a straight. The 10 of hearts makes us a straight flush and any heart is just going to give us a flush. I think our seven is probably not the best hand here, which is one of the reasons why we probably should be checking back this turn. But I also think that this turn card is not going to be so great for Lynn. So I don't see her check raising us a ton here. So by betting this turn, it allows us to maintain the betting lead and it allows us to win a much bigger pot if the heart does actually come in. And it allows us to bet big when we improve to a straight. So I'm definitely on the fence if I should bet here or not. Obviously in game, I decided on bet and Lynn made the call again. River is the eight of spades. So now we have two pair on a very scary board for Lynn. If she happens to have an over pair, if she happens to have a pair of jacks, another spot where perhaps a thin value bet is in order, but it's also interesting because Lynn can definitely have a 10 here. She could have a hand like Jack 10, she could have in like pocket tens. So unlike the other spots, this one isn't so clear cut that we have the best hand. I think it's likely we have the best hand, but it's definitely very close. I checked. Oh, hold on. I'll check. Another one for Johnny Vibes. Started vlogging about five years ago. Here we have Jimmy raising it up from middle position. Andrew calls hijack. Frankie calls cutoff. And I'm in the big blind with the suited ace here. Think that this is a spot that I could be putting some pressure on and squeezing. But I like to just make the call, see a flop. Flop comes down nine, three, four. Pretty decent flop for us. We do have a straight draw. We have a backdoor flush draw. Check it over to Jimmy. He checks. Andrew checks and it checks all the way over to Frankie. Frankie puts out a small bet of 250. With all the players left to act behind me, I think that the best play here is to check raise. Frankie is what they call a field better. So his range is going to be hands like queen jack, jack 10, pocket pairs like fives, sixes, sevens, eights. All these hands are going to have a tough time versus a check raise here. So I go ahead and slide out $800. Action is now on Jimmy and he does not immediately release. Jimmy decides to now put in a re-raise to 2750. Frankie quickly releases and as do I, I quickly release this one into the muck. Turns out Jimmy had top set. Andrew opens the hijack and Lynn three bets the small blind up to 600. And I look down at an ace king. In this formation, my hand is definitely going to be ahead of both of their ranges. I don't want to call here and invite Andrew into the pot, so I decide to put in the re-raise. Four bets up to 1,900. It's a 1,900 and wins. 
Jimmy raises this one up in early position to three big blinds. Conrad folds, Andrew calls, Cedric calls the cutoff, and we look down at Ace Jack suited in the small blind. Definitely can put in a three bet here. Haven't really seen Jimmy's opening ranges from early position, so I'm not sure how loose he has been playing at this point. So I just decided to take the low variance route here. Don't really love my decision to call, but I do love that it's suited. So it gives us a lot more options post-flop. So we end up going four ways to a flop. Just like our last hand with ace deuce suited, I'm gonna play this one as a check. And this time Jimmy checks again. So when Andrew bets, and this is what I talked about in the previous hand, Andrew is a field better. Someone who was not the aggressor pre-flop that called in position is now betting. Cedric makes the fold. And Andrew's gonna have a very similar range to what I put Frankie on a couple hands ago. He can have hands like nine, 10 suited, jack, 10 suited, queen, jack. King, queen, pocket nines, pocket eights, pocket sevens, pocket sixes. But that range shrinks up a little bit when you have players on your left. And Cedric was on his left. So now I'm weighting him more towards hands like nine, 10, eight, nine, pocket nines, pocket eights, pocket sevens. And against a more condensed range like that, I don't want to be check raising my ace jack suited. I'm more than happy to take this price and see a turn card. Jimmy makes a fold and we're now heads up to a turn. Turn is a four of hearts. So some draws actually do get there, five, six. I'm more likely to have a five, six in this spot. So I can definitely see why Andrew checked back here if he does have a value hand. The river comes a seven of hearts, brings the back door flush in. Like I said, I think that Andrew is going to have a hand like nine, 10 suited, pocket nines. I don't think he has pocket eights or pocket sevens anymore, obviously, because of this run out. I just don't think I'm going to be able to bluff him here. He could definitely have a seven in his hand, a hand like nine, seven suited, but he probably just has a hand like ace, eight suited or eight, nine or 10, eight or something like that. All of which I don't think are going to fold for a bet. So I go ahead and check and this run out was actually worrisome for Andrew as well. And he he ends up making the check back with the 9-8 suited. This plan is pretty crazy. We have a new player at the table, Kitty Quo. She's a good player, so she's definitely not a fun person to have on my left. So when I open it up with queens here, now we're playing nine-handed, and Kitty three bets me from the hijack, and now Ashley puts in another re-raise of four bet to 1,500, and now Conrad sitting on a $4,200 stack, and Conrad is the ace king. Oh, it's already it's been good. cold four bet in <laughs> front of him. I just know my style. I like it. All of it. Yeah, going out, you know. Johnny, the one feel. sitting there really with like queens and instantly <laughs> places them into the muck. Wow. I mean, it's the cold five bet. Uh, of course, Ashley and Conrad were both strong. And instead of having aces and kings, they swapped some cards around and now they just both have ace king. And if I knew they both had ace king, obviously I want to be in there with queens, especially when the flop comes with a queen on it. The river was quads. You can kind of see my face in the background here. Rest assured on the inside, I was pretty irritated that I would have made quads. All right, shaking it off. Next hand I open is pocket nines and kitty three bets me again. Kitty definitely came to play, but we're not going to be folding pocket nines. Cut off versus button. So I make the call and go into trap mode. Interesting flop here, queen, queen, six. The kind of flop where if nines were ahead pre-flop, they're probably still ahead on the flop. Check it over to Kitty and she makes a continuation bet here. This is the kind of board where she is gonna be making a bet very often. So I toss in the call. River double pairs, continue to check this one over. Kitty checks it back. So I think she's gonna have a hand like ace high here pretty often. So when we get a nine on the river, giving us a full house. It's an interesting full house. Obviously we lose to any queen, but I definitely don't think Kitty has a queen. I think she probably would have just bet the turn if she had a queen. It's also really hard for either of us to have a six here. So the question is sizing here on the river. There's $1,725 in the pot. I decide to go with 1,500. I'm just hoping that she has a hand like jacks or tens and finds a call here, but she quickly releases. She ended up having king high, king jack of clubs. Perfectly fine play by her, well played. My nines just happen to hold up. It's one of the bigger hands that I play in the session. Cedric makes it three big blinds from early position. I look down at a suited ace three, decide to make the call and kitty three bets again. At this point, I haven't seen any of Kitty's hands. I probably should have just three bet this one myself. But now here we are. Cedric makes the call, getting a fairly good price, about 200 big blinds effective. So I go ahead and close the action and make the call here. This one checks around and the four of clubs comes on the turn. 
And when it checks to me a second time here, now we have a straight draw and a flush draw. So I decide to put in a bluff here, a semi bluff, and I bet 1500. Turns out Kitty had ace king. So we do get a better hand to fold, but Cedric makes the call. The river is the five of hearts. So we do make the nut flush, but it's not the best heart for us because now any three makes a straight. Cedric checks it to us. And now our only question is sizing. I don't think Cedric has a queen because he checked twice on the flop. And then again on the turn, I don't think he has a flush. He probably does not have a three. So this this one's really tough to size. There's 48.75 in the middle. I bet 80% pot on the river here. And as you can see, Cedric thinks about it for quite a while. Reason why I sized 80% pot here, $4,000, is because I could sense that Cedric was a bit frustrated and he was playing a bit sticky at this point. And it turns out he had pocket tens and did not want to fold here. He does flick in the call. Johnny Vibes gets paid off. By the way, if you are enjoying this strategy video, don't forget to subscribe and click the thumbs up. It's free and helps my channel out a ton. All right, back to the session. Here we have a high value hand under the gun, ace king off suit, raise this one up three times the big blind. Only caller is Lynn from the big blind. Good flop for our hand here as we flop top pair. We do have the king of hearts in our hand, which definitely is comforting because even if a heart comes on the turn, we're going to hold the nut flush draw. I like betting here. This is a board that we are going to be C betting a lot. So it's nice to actually have the top pair here. Plus, like I said, we do have the king of hearts in our hand and there is a distinct possibility that we could get three streets of value here depending on the run out. Toss out about a two thirds pot bet here and Lynn quickly makes the call. Turn is the eight of spades, which now brings backdoor spade draw. On these boards, when there's two flush draws and some straight draws out there, it's better to bet big because there are so many hands that she can call down with here. I settled on $600, which was nearly full pot, but I actually think that I could probably go maybe eight, $900 in the spot. She makes the call and we are off to the Ace of Diamonds River. We're pretty much never beat in this spot. If she would have had a hand that beat us on the turn, she would have check raised on that dynamic board. So we can safely value bet here. And I go about full pot here. If she also has an ace, I just don't see her folding. And because both flush draws bricked off, there is a possibility that she might find a hero. Unfortunately, she just had queen high though, and she tossed her cards into the muck. Here we have another big hand, ace queen suited, facing a raise from Conrad in the hijack. Cedric calls on the button. I'm in the big blind perfect squeeze opportunity. Both players are not overly deep, but our hand is too high up in value for us to flat. So I go ahead and make it $750 and Conrad thinks about it for quite a while, which tells me that he has a tough decision here. On his stack, this should be an automatic decision if he doesn't have a strong hand. And since he is taking so long, I'm automatically thinking that he does have something strong here. I think he has just enough chips to where if he decides to move all in, I probably can make the fold here with ace queen of hearts but after a lot of deliberation conrad settles on a flat call cedric comes along for the ride he only has another 2600 behind in his stack already 2275 in the pot so it's going to be tough for me to bluff cedric here gonna need to find a favorable flop with our hand great flop here flopping top pair think this is one of those situations where I'm going to be so far ahead of my opponents. Standard, of course, is to see bet this flop, but I think that checking is okay when you have Cedric on the button who is definitely frustrated. I think that he could take some stabs here and perhaps bluff shove all of his chips in the pot. And the cool thing is, is we're not really protecting from much. There was no draws out there. So I have no problem letting cards come off here because I just don't see many hands being able to catch up with ace queen here. They don't take the bait though. They check it back and the jack of clubs comes on the turn. I think if I show weakness one more street, perhaps Cedric might take a stab here. But unfortunately, no, he checks this one back again and the five of hearts comes on the river. Of course, I can't just let this one check through. I'm gonna have to put out a bet and hope to get a crying call from one of the two players. I bet a reasonable size here, 1500. And Conrad actually has pocket 10, so he played this one well to not put any chips in after the flop. He does end up making the laydown correctly. Cedric was just playing the board, so not a decision for him as well, and he lets it go. This is a really tough spot. This is uh, one of the reasons why I liked blurring out the hands because as you can see here, Button raises, Lynn now three bets to 600 and we have pocket tens in the big line. No need to make this a big sizing, especially with Cedric not having a ton of chips. 
I also want to make sure that the betting is still open in case Cedric decides to move all in. I can now move all in. So I go ahead and four bet that small sizing and Cedric wastes little time before moving all in. And then Lynn just snap moves all of her chips into the middle, $12,650. According to the graphics, I'm waiting for the count here to get the official count, but it is a lot of chips. And we're sitting here with pocket tens in a situation where it's really tough to think that Lynn has a worse pair than us. Only thing we can really beat here is perhaps ace king. I think it's a no brainer situation against Cedric, but Lynn has definitely complicated the matter. I end up letting it go kind of like I did with the queens earlier. It just feels like the right move here. And it turns out we were up against Lynn's ace king. Here we have Lynn raising it up from the cutoff and I look down at queen nine suited on the button. I go ahead and three bet this one up. Lynn defends and we go to a flop of jack jack four with two diamonds. We have a flush draw, definitely not a bad flop for us. I start with a small continuation bet here, 400, and Lynn makes the call. I think her range here is gonna be a lot of pocket pairs, and when the jack peels off, it definitely concerns me because it's really difficult to get people to fold pocket pairs. Obviously, for any normal sizing here, there's 1675 in the pot, let's say I bet. 800, let's say I bet 1,000, let's say I bet 1,200. She's not gonna fold any full houses for that sizing. So for me to actually get her to fold here, I'm gonna have to use a ridiculous sizing. And I end up going with 2,800, which is a massive over bet. And the reason why I do this is because I can have over pairs here. I can have queens, I can have kings, I can have aces, and she just never has those hands. So this is a range play. I'm basically putting her to the test with a small full house. And with my image, I just think that it's gonna work. Wow. <laughs> But what like, 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 oh, my Lynn lets like, it go. Wow. Johnny really wrapping the over pairs there, and it does get the job done. And as you can see, she reluctantly lets it go. Nobody likes folding a full house, but in her mind, she felt like if she made that call that it could be an even bigger one on the river. It's just hard to hold on with the small full house there. All right, here's a very interesting hand. We have a new player at the table, Xuan Lu. She's a very good player late to the game. This is right before our dinner break. And as you can see, I have a $26,000 stack. So I'm up 16,000 at this point. Open it up with the king jack of spades under the gun and we face a three bet from the cutoff. Interesting spot here. And let's see what range converter says. It actually shows king jack suited as primarily a fold here. 94.4% a fold, 5.6% a call. I gotta say, I'm a little surprised. I thought that this was a pretty standard call. I guess if we're playing on a live stream, this is a very standard call. But as you can see, our defending range versus a three bet here is pretty narrow, especially when playing against a tough player like Xuan Lu. But anyways, we go ahead and make the call and the flop is good for us. We flop a king, we flop backdoor spade draw, Xuan bet 350. Of course, the standard play is to just call here, which is totally fine. And that's actually what I did in game. One of the reasons why check raising is a little bit dangerous is because Xuan has an advantage over us. She has more ace kings, she has aces, she has pocket kings and we just don't have those hands at the same frequency that she does. So after I make the call here and we see a turn card, the 10 of hearts, gonna continue to check this one over to Schwan, and she now reaches and tosses out 1100. Totally reasonable sizing here, very easy call in this spot. At this point, I don't think we can be raising. She still holds the range advantage over us and she is now saying that her hand is strong after three betting pre, betting flop and betting turn. The river is a three of spades and I go ahead and check this one over one more time, 39.75 in the pot and Schwan continues. She bets 2000 and it just feels like she has this beat. You know, she's three bet pre, barreled all the streets on this run out, hands that she could have that beat us, ace five of diamonds, pocket aces, pocket kings, king 10, pocket tens. I don't think she has a hand like five, six, the only hand I really beat here is ace queen. And I think if she had ace queen, she probably would have bet bigger on the river. So getting this price 2000 to win 8,000, we just have to toss in the call here. It's one of those math things. And as you can see, I start talking it out. She's a good player. I'm not supposed to hold this hand. You get so many <laughs> oh. Oh. Why? Because of Most handsome man list. I'm not supposed to yeah. hold Toby? this hand again. <laughs> He's gonna fold. How bad could it be? How bad could it be? How bad could it be? Toby's 
Like a little table oh, talk here. Oh, the book says cold, cute. of course, but I just have to let it go. I yes. Don't know. yes. Juan, 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 Juan. <laughs> Show it. And I make the wrong decision. And it, the reason why is just because sometimes I feel like I have to go with my gut despite what the math says. And this is one of those situations where I was just dead wrong. And it's a good lesson, honestly, because so many times in poker, the math is telling us that we're required to do something and we should just listen to the math so often. It's like folding King's preflop. It's just one of those things where if they're ever bluffing, we just have to put the chips in and expect to lose some portion of the time. Now, keep in mind, this is definitely when you're playing against a good player. There are definitely situations where you're playing against a more recreational type player where you can just go against the math and make big folds. Here we have Kitty raising it up for a big sizing, 200 under the gun, and I find ace, queen in the big blind. No dead money in the pot, so while my hand is gonna be ahead of her hand the majority of the time, I decide to play this one a little tricky due to Kitty's aggressive image. I think that I can under rep, and on the right boards, I think she'll bluff and we can win a nice pot. Bluff comes out 10 4 4. We check and Kitty continues. This is one of those boards where she's gonna continue at a high frequency. So we're gonna go ahead and make the call here with the ace queen. Turn comes the eight of diamonds. Not a great card for our hand and we continue to check here. Kitty quickly checks it back and the river is the deuce of clubs. Check it over again and Kitty puts out a reasonable bet, 600 here. I'm just gonna go ahead and let you guys hear the table talk. Chunky little drop of <laughs> black chips there. <laughs> Chunky little dew drop. Oh, chunk them right, right I down. Six. It's high. Which one? I get six. It might be chop. Maybe like chop hot. <laughs> but I'm not being it's high river, right? No, you're not. So maybe based on like a queen high. I better turn. So I don't have a queen high. No, you don't. You're actually all saying the truth. Yeah. <laughs> she is. I don't know that she's leading him to the conclusion she wants to. It's reverse psychology. <laughs> All right, this is an interesting one against Ashley. She opens it up under the gun, $150, three times the big blind, folds over to me in the small blind, and I have a jack 10 suited here. Looking at range converter, this is actually a mixed spot. This is a spot where I can basically have all the options on the table, fold, call, or raise. I decide on call and Kitty comes along as well from the big blind. Here we flop top pair and we check this one over to Ashley. She decides to continue for a small sizing here. Facing this small sizing, I think that our hand is gonna be good the majority of the time here. And like I said, the standard play is definitely to call, but three-handed. I'm gonna go ahead and check raise this one with our top pair. When she uses that small size, she's just gonna have so many worse hands. And there's so many cards that can come on the turn that are gonna allow her to catch up with some equity and play so well in position. So I make it 500 and when action is back on Ashley, she decides to make the call here. Turn is a six of diamonds and this is definitely better for our range, but our hand, it doesn't really do much for. I think a small bet is in order here. Although I decided on check in game, which in hindsight, I yeah, I don't really like it. I think I should be betting again here. The river comes a queen of hearts and now it's just really difficult for me to get any value here. Basically our hand is just too good to bluff here and I think serves much better as a bluff catcher. So when I check it over to her, she puts out a reasonable bet here at 1200. So a lot of times when these decisions are close, if I do have a hand that blocks what she's trying to say that she has, either a queen jack or a jack nine, I'll just toss in the call because me blocking that hand just makes it less likely for her to have it. And oftentimes it's just a small thing that will influence my decision when it's close one way or the other. So when I say this comment, it basically just means that I feel like I have to call when I have this card in my hand. Ugh, I hate having a jack in my hand. Oh. Yeah, show him. You got bluffs. You got bluffs. She got bluffs too. That's why you don't go against the book. We've taken a nice long dinner break. And at this point, I'm actually a couple margaritas deep, opening it up with seven, eight suited under the gun. Matt, newcomer to the table, calls us and Schwan three bets the cutoff. She has a 12K stack. So I definitely think I can speculate here. Definitely a loose call, especially against someone of Schwan's caliber. Normally when you have hands like this, it's better to continue against players who aren't as aggressive 
and whose ranges aren't quite as wide. Because even if I do make my hand, Schwann's gonna be in position and she's not necessarily gonna have a big hand to pay me off. So I think it's actually better to fold here. Of course, the flop comes out terrible for our hand and we just make the check fold anyway. This one is a straddled pot by Lynn and I open it up in early position with pocket sevens. Matt in the hijack, three bets this one and now Schwann makes the four bet on the button. I of course make the fold here, but it's definitely feeling like Schwann is playing very aggressively playing very well. And most of her aggression has been getting through. We haven't really been seeing her hands show down. So there's definitely a little bit of mystery as to how out of line she's been. All right, this is the craziest hand of the session and all the Schwan Lu talk is definitely queuing this one up here. She's on a $14,000 stack. I'm on a $28,000 stack. I go ahead and make a raise from early position with the king nine off suit. Yes, a little loose, but like I said, been feeling a little tipsy and having a little bit of fun. Everything's been going my way. So I feel like I can definitely open it up a little bit. Folds over to Schwan in the small blind and she three bets again. And like I just, mentioned it feels like she's being hyper aggressive we have not seen her cards and i have a king in my hand which blocks some of the hands that she's going to be three betting for value with so i go ahead and put in the four bet to 2000 not recommended and schwan now makes the call out of position heads up that means she has a good hand. She's not really gonna be messing around here, heads up out of position. Now 4,000 in the pot, she has 12,000 behind. Ace, eight, eight. This is a board that I'm going to continue with a high frequency. I just want her to fold her pocket queens, pocket jacks, pocket tens kind of holdings here. This is the kind of board that in a four bet pot, you definitely don't need to go big here. So I go for a thousand. She does make the call and now the queen comes on the turn and I'm pretty much in no man's land here. We got 6,000 in the pot. She has 11,000 behind and I just have no equity against her hand. She could have a hand like ace king she could have a hand like ace queen she could even have pocket aces in this spot the only hand that i really think i can get her to fold here is pocket jacks or pocket tens so when i put out a bet here four thousand of course this is the last attempt to get her to fold she only has 11 in her stack so if she makes the call here she's only gonna have seven left of course, if she moves all in, I'm snap folding. But, but think about it, in her spot, I four bet pre-flop, I bet flop, and I bet again here on the turn. I at minimum have ace king, perhaps even ace queen, maybe even queens. I'm just hoping that she doesn't have any of those hands. And as you can tell, Schwan believes the story. She doesn't realize how tipsy I am and how I've illogically just decided to take a stand in this one hand. And I don't really blame her for folding here because I'm just not gonna have a bluff like King Nine off suit very often. It took a special set of circumstances for me to show up with this hand here. But with that said, it's really tough to fold Ace King here. Sometimes you just have to go with it when your opponent is capable of bluffing. The thing is, is she owned me most of the session. So it feels nice to get one through and that caps off a crazy session, a session where it was pretty much upwards the whole entire time. Obviously the margaritas affected my decision making after our dinner break, but extremely happy to finish with an over $30,000 stack winning nearly $21,000. And that's it from this session in Vegas. There's so many more live streams, so many more poker videos coming up. And if you wanna hear more about the time that I staked my bartender and he turned that stake into an over $40,000 score, click on this video.